So you'll notice that here at the beginning. To Ryan's left is Shelly Quinn. Always a joy to have you here. Always a joy to be here. Amen. To your left, Pastor John Lomacain, my pastor. Looking forward to sharing with you as well. Yes, Isaiah is going to be an exciting study. Yes, absolutely. Last but not least, Pastor Kenny Shelton. Always a joy to study with you too. Mm -hmm. It's always a privilege and look forward to the study. Amen. Amen. Before we go any further, in this quarterly, Isaiah, Comfort My People, it was written by Dr. Roy Gain. He is a tremendous Hebrew scholar and teacher of Old Testament at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. And he did an amazing job. Amen. I just have to say that up front, I was blessed as I studied this quarterly. You can open up to Isaiah 1 because we're starting there. This lesson will focus on Isaiah chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 5. But before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Pastor John, would you sure. pray for us? Our loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege and opportunity that is always granted to us when we open your word. Mm -hmm. Guide our minds and hearts that what is said and what is done will bring glory and honor to you. Amen. The clarity of this book, mm. may it be absorbed into our hearts, into our minds. Mm -hmm. And may those watching and listening Mm. find reason to continue to trust God and his word. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Prayed up and ready to go. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, before we actually jump into lesson number one, I just want to do a brief overview of the book of Isaiah, seeing this is the very first lesson of the quarter. And you know I like dividing things into lists, so we're going to look at the author. We're going to look at the historical setting for the book and the themes or the theology that is developed throughout the book of Isaiah. That's the author, the historical setting, and the themes or theology that you find in the book of Isaiah. Of course, Isaiah 1-1 tells us who the author is. That is Isaiah, the son of Amos. Isaiah is perhaps one of the greatest of the biblical prophets. Mm -hmm. His name means the Lord saves. And it's fitting for the theme of the book. The book is really divided into two sections. The first section, chapters 1 through 39, is the book of judgment and salvation. This is, you could say, the historical section of the book of Isaiah. There were two major national crises that took place in the kingdom of Judah during the time of Isaiah. The first, of course, in 735 BC. We'll study that when we get to Isaiah chapter 7. This was the Syro-Ephraimite coalition, the nation of Israel and the nation of Syria coming together against and attacking against the nation of Judah. That was the first national crisis. The second national crisis, of course, is during the reign of King Hezekiah. This would be down Isaiah 36, 37, 38. And this is 701 BC. Remember, 185,000 Assyrians were slain in one night mm. by the angel of the Lord. Now, the second half of the book of Isaiah, this is chapter 40 through chapter 66, is more prophetic in nature. This is the book of comfort, the book of restoration. The reason I say it's prophetic is Isaiah was looking forward to the Babylonian captivity and then the time when the exiles would return, when the remnant would return. Some scholars see that two people wrote the book of Isaiah, but we don't subscribe to that. In fact, in the Qumran, you can see there is no, if you find the um, scroll of Isaiah, there is no chapter break between 39 and 40. There's no division. It is all one book. The lesson said this, even in translation, which loses the evocative word plays and alliteration of the Hebrew, the book of Isaiah has few peers in the history of literature, whether it's sacred or secular. What about the themes of the book? We find it is really a book of salvation. We find Jesus, our Messiah, mm -hmm. the suffering servant, the messianic king, especially Isaiah chapter 53. The picture of the Messiah is probably revealed more clearly there than anywhere else in the Old Testament. We find, of course, the book of judgment, that judgment does not just come against God's people, but other nations, Babylon and Assyria and Philistia and Moab and Syria and Israel and Ethiopia and Egypt and Babylon and Edom, Arabia, Jerusalem, Tyre, the entire earth. That's the first, say, 24 chapters of the book of Isaiah. Then, of course, we find that book of comfort, those promises of healing and comfort and deliverance and salvation and forgiveness and restoration. 
we find God's holiness. The portrait of God reaches unparalleled heights in the book of Isaiah. God's holiness is emphasized more in Isaiah than probably anywhere else in the word of God. We see God's sovereignty, that he can predict the future and that he oversees all things. We see truth. We see God's mercy, hesed, his goodness and kindness, love, covenant love with his people. We see his covenant all throughout the book of Isaiah and that he made a covenant with them. And even though they left him, they forsook him. Mm. He did not forsake them. Yeah. We see God's promise. When I uh, highlight in my Bible, I always put promises in yellow. In the book of Isaiah, especially the latter yeah. half is oh. full of yellow well. because there's promises of forgiveness and restoration and resurrection and eternal life and a new heavens and a new earth peace and strength and mercy and peace and salvation and deliverance and protection and provision, mm. Holy Spirit anointing, vindication, mm. gospel evangelism, all of that's found in the book of mm. Isaiah. And we also find God's remnant in Isaiah. Right. A remnant will choose to return to him, to seek forgiveness, to walk in obedience. The other thing we find is God's waiting or really our need to wait on God. The problem with God's people in that time is they were trusting the wrong things and the wrong people. They were trusting earthly powers. They were trusting other gods. They were trusting themselves. They were trusting unfaithful leaders. They were even trusting, as we will discover, mediums and spiritists. Mm. But there's a great need to wait on God, to trust only in God, wait upon Him. So let's jump into... Our lesson, the memory text, is Isaiah 1, verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The lesson started with a little cute story of a, a boy who is in a crowded store, and you've probably seen this, and all of a sudden he loses his mama, and he can't find her, and he's crying out, I need my mama, where's my mama? <laughs> now, there's a lot of women in the store, mm -hmm. but the boy knows his mom. He recognizes his mom. Why is that? Because he knows who he is, and he knows whose he is. Mm -hmm. He knows he who he belongs to. The problem with the children of Israel, the people in Judah right now, is that they forgot whose they were. They mm. forgot who they mm. belonged to. Right. This week we look at how God seeks to restore his people back to himself. Let's look at Isaiah 1 verse 2. Isaiah 1, verse 2, the very first part of it. It begins with, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Now, this is legal vocabulary, and if you look at the literary form, this is what we call a reeb. Now, you might say, what in the world is a reeb? <laughs> this is God bringing a formal indictment against the people of Judah. Arib is God's covenant lawsuit, God taking legal action against his people because of their failure to keep his covenant. We see Arib in Acts chapter 7. Remember the deacon Stephen. Just before he stoned, he pronounced Arib, as it were, against the people, this judgment against them because they had rejected and crucified mm. Jesus as the Messiah. So we see this happening here. Isaiah begins, really, the book of Isaiah with this read. God's covenant lawsuit. God's bringing a formal indictment against the people. And what are the sins that he identifies? I see two sins. Of course, the rest of the panel will discuss more in detail this chapter one. First is rebellion. And the second is a lack of knowledge and discernment. Mm. If you look at the second half of verse 2, it says, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have, what's that word? Rebelled, Rebelled mm. against me. Mm -hmm. Jump down to verse 4. 
Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger. That word in Hebrew means to spurn, mm. to treat with contempt. They have treated the Holy One of Israel with contempt. They have turned away backward. Mm. They have rebelled oh. against God. Uh -huh. And we also see they forgot who their master was in verse 3, Isaiah 1, verse 3. This is that lack of knowledge and discernment. The ox knows its ma owner and the donkey its master's crib, like the little boy knew his mama in the store. Mm -hmm. But Israel mm -hmm. does not know. My people do not consider. Mm -hmm. That word consider in Hebrew is discern. They lacked knowledge and discernment. They forgot who their master was. Mm. There's an interesting comparison in the next two verses, verses five and six. As I read these verses, think about a couple of the verbs that are used here. And I wanna look at the comparison between the judgment against the people of Judah and the same words used where Christ took our sin upon him. Mm. The words are stricken, wounds, and bruised. Okay, we're going to compare Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 53. Mm. Isaiah 1, 5, and 6. Why should you be stricken again? See that word stricken. You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But wounds, you see that word? And mm. bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. Now Isaiah 53 verse five says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And verse four says, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. So what I see there, that parallel or comparison, the people had forsaken God, they had gone their own way, they had rebelled, they did mm. not discern, they did not even know who their God was. And yet he took mm -hmm. their punishment, yeah. their sin, some mm. of the same words used right. upon himself to redeem them back to himself mm. because God always has a remnant. Mm -hmm. And we see this theme of remnant first introduced in verse nine. Mm -hmm. It says, because verse seven and eight talks about the country is desolate and the city's burned with fire and there's just total devastation. Verse nine, unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant. Mm -hmm. See that word? Mm -hmm. In the beginning right here, we would think there's total destruction. We would think this book is going to be hopeless, but right now it opens the door for hope that God has a remnant and he himself will redeem his people. Praise Pastor God. Ryan. Mm. Yeah. Man, that was beautiful. Beautiful setup. Beautiful setup. Yeah. I have uh, Monday's lesson, uh, which is entitled Rotten Ritualism. Well. <laughs> Rotten Ritualism. There's a lot that we can learn from this particular lesson. As I was going through and studying the verses for this lesson, I just, mm. I could just sense the Lord's plea, his crying, his, his attitude towards his people in, in such love, but yet sometimes you got to show a little bit of tough love, right? right? And that's essentially what God is doing here. He has given chance and opportunity and opportunity, chance after chance to Israel to turn from their wicked ways. Mm -hmm. And now he, as Jill brought out beautifully, he's calling them out for it. He mm -hmm. is putting them on the stand and he's saying, okay, now is the time we're going to address this issue. So I want to start reading in, 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 in verse 10. So Isaiah chapter one, verse 10, which kind of builds off of verse 9 that you just read, Jill. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to read verse 9 one more time so that you can see the context of what, is, uh, what God is saying in verse 10. So Jill just read in verse 9, it says, Unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah, Mercy. right? And you think, well, that's that's a that's a strong uh, mm -hmm. that's a that's a strong application there, Sodom and Gomorrah. But then notice what God says in verse ten, Isaiah chapter one, verse ten. The Bible says, "Hear the word of the Lord." But then notice the uh, the, the 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 application He's applying here. He says, "You rulers oh. of Sodom, give ear to the law of our God, you people 
of Gomorrah. So there's a little bit of a symbolic language that's being used here to describe the condition, how God is now viewing his people. The, they, they have become like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah mm-hmm. in the sense that Judah, in this context, has forgotten God mm-hmm. and were living as if there was no God at all. Yeah. Just like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. You go back and study that. God had to deal with that city because they had reached a point in which he couldn't even find 10 righteous people in the entire city. And so God had to deal with them strongly. And, and that's essentially what is happening with Israel. We're moving toward that particular uh, judgment that is coming because they have forgotten God. They have forsaken God. And of course, their actions and their choices have become a reproach to God. And so he's calling them out. But notice verse Verses 11 through 15, okay? Uh, This is where an even stronger rebuke comes. And God is, again, uh, he's calling them out for their sinful deeds. So Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 through 15. The Bible says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? Okay, so let's keep in mind as we're reading through these Mm -hmm. verses, the title of this lesson is Rotten Ritualism, okay? Mm -hmm. So God is about to bring to their attention that all the things, they're just going through the motions, Mm -hmm. they're doing the sacrifices, they're holding the services in the temple, they're burning the incense, they're doing all those things that the covenant people were supposed to be doing, but God has a little bit different attitude towards Mm -hmm. those actions now. So Mm -hmm. he says there in verse 11, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Mm. Mm -hmm. Bring no futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to Mm me. The new moons and the Sabbaths and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. And then verse 14, your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. Mm. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Mm. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Mm. Your hands are full of blood. Mm. So what is God addressing here? It's very clear that they are living in a state of intense apostasy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yet, at the same time, they're still going through the motions of what God has asked them to do. And so essentially, Mm -hmm. what God is doing is He's calling them out. He's saying, look, you know, you're doing doing all that I've asked you to do as far as the rituals. You're going through the motions. You're doing the practices. You know, you're practicing the rites and the ceremonies Mm -hmm. and the feasts, and you're doing all the little things that I've asked. But guess what? It's of no avail. It's It's of no importance to me because your heart is not right. right. And you'll notice here that he said in that last closing text there of verse 15, and these are strong words for for us to hear this from God. So for someone to have to hear these words from the Creator would be haunting, right? That, that, you know what, when you lift up your hands in worship and praise, you know what, I'm going to hide my eyes. Mm. He says, and and if you, even when you pray to me, you know, I'm not going to hear it. Why? Your hands are full of blood. So what was going on here? You see, these... These same hands offered sacrifices, but yet even though they were lifted up in prayer, the Bible says they were full of blood. Mm. That is that they are guilty Mm. of violence and oppression towards others. Mm. And so what we're seeing is that by mistreating, so they're mistreating their own people. Mm. They're guilty for the murder and the mistreatment of their own people. And by mistreating others, that is the members of the covenant community, they were showing contempt for the protector of all of Israel. Mm. Mm. Sins against other people were sins against the Lord. So just as we find those texts in Scripture, God says, you do this to them, so you've done it to me. That's exactly what was happening here. Mm -hmm. An attack on their own people was an attack on God. Mm -hmm. The rituals were, uh, you know, and and Shelley would know this, these these rituals, these ceremonies, these feast days, these these ceremonial Sabbaths and all the offerings and the sacrifices and the incense, Mm -hmm. all of that God did give to them, but only within the context of the covenant. But yet they had violated the covenant by oppressing their own people. Mm -hmm. And so what we see here is that essentially their sinful actions had become with the practices of these rituals and simultaneous, we see that it was basically a slap in God's face. And God says, I'm not having it. It it reminds me of that text over in um, 
Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, where Jesus says uh, to the Pharisees, He says, You draw nigh unto me with your lips, yeah. but your heart, heart is far, far from me. Mm. So notice the counsel that God gives to them because of these sins. Of course, God always provides a way of escape, right? He always yeah. provides a way to make things right. And we see that in verses 16 and 17 in Isaiah chapter 1. So notice what the Bible says, Isaiah 1, 16 and 17. God says to them, He says, Wash yourselves. Hmm. Make yourselves clean. Mm -hmm. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Mm -hmm. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Yes. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Mm -hmm. So what is God doing here? He's calling them to repentance, true, genuine repentance. Mm -hmm. And notice that it's a choice. I just have to add this in here. Yeah. No one's showing up in the presence of God to say, well, Lord, look, we can't help it. It's our nature. That's just what we do. We're evil by nature. Mm -hmm. This is a choice. God's saying it's conditional. You have a choice. Yeah. You can choose me. You can repent or you can continue down this path and it's going to lead you nowhere good. Mm -hmm. He calls them, notice this in mm -hmm. what the text we just read, verses 16 and 17. He calls them to take a stand for what is right wow. and to take a stand against the injustices being done to the oppressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we need to do that sometime? Mm. Of course. Does God call us to take a stand for what is right? Amen. In fact, I, having recently taken a, uh, a preaching uh, class through my, through my seminary program mm. at Andrews, I learned that after reading this passage here, what Isaiah is preaching here is he's preaching what is called a prophetic sermon. Well, Not in the sense that he's preaching prophecy, but yet he is declaring, he's challenging mm. right here. He's addressing the real issues of his day and his message is very countercultural. <laughs> and he's challenging the status quo. Right. He's calling them out. Well. He's saying what you're doing is wrong, and he's taking a stand against these evils. Yeah. And so that's what Isaiah is, mm. is, is basically, God is, is using Isaiah to preach this message, to com communicate this message. And, uh, you know, all of this reminds me also of what Jesus done, likewise, when he was speaking to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. Mm -hmm. When he was calling out the Pharisees, yes. mm -hmm. woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. I'm, I'm looking at Matthew 23, verses 23 mm -hmm. through 28. I don't have enough time to read it all, but I just want to read a few of these words here. Jesus understood the issues of his day. He understood yes. what was going on and that there needed that these issues needed to be addressed. No more yes. sugarcoating, no more watering down. Sometimes the plain truth of God's word, the straight testimony needs to be spoken. And yeah. of course, in love. And of course, this message, God is delivering it in love. And of course, Christ, when he spoke to the Pharisees, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Oh, that's strong language, right? Yeah. If you walked up to someone today and said, whoa, you yeah. hypocrite, oh you know, they would say, don't you judge me. <laughs> we live in a world of don't judge me. Well. But he goes on to say to the Pharisees, for you pay tithe and mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you have ought to have done without leaving others undone, blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Ooh. Jesus, again, to the Pharisees, he was, he was addressing the issues of the day. That's what God is doing. He's, yeah. had, he's had it up to here with Israel. And he's finally saying, look, I love you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you another opportunity, but we need to address these issues. And the same thing applies with us. Yeah. You know, like Judah and Israel, you know, sometimes we can get caught up in that. Uh -huh. And uh, we also need to understand that God is calling us to repentance and to stand Absolutely. against those who oppress. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. Thank yeah. you so much, Ryan. Incredible yeah. study. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to lesson number one, A Crisis of Identity. We're going to pick up with Tuesday's lesson, Shelley Quinn. Oh, thank you so much. I'm excited about Tuesday's lesson because it is the argument of forgiveness. Mm. Here these degenerate Judeans had broken covenant with God, mm. but his sharp words against them were not a rejection. Mm -hmm. They were an invitation to turn around. And as you read mm. in verse 16, he's saying, wash yourselves. He's 
he's suggesting reform to the people, mm -hmm. and this suggests hope. You know something that's interesting? How many books are there in the Bible? Mm -hmm. 66. 66. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. Interesting. That's the division of Isaiah. 39 in the Old are showing people their great need of salvation. I mean, his first 39, mm -hmm. the last 27 are God's great provision of salvation. That's right. And that's why Isaiah is called the gospel mm. prophet. But let's look mm. at, um, beginning with verse 18, we will see that this mm. is kind of a preview of what the last 27 chapters are that focus on God's grace. So Isaiah 118, which was mm. our memory verse, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he says, this is God. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, yes. they shall be white as snow. Yeah. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Come, this is an invitation mm -hmm. to approach God. He still gives that invitation today. And then he's saying, let us reason together. He's pleading with them. He wants them to receive his correction. He wants them to, to repent, to turn around mm -hmm. and come right. back to him. When you look at these two colors, crimson, which was a scarlet red, this was a permanent dye that was, it was a deep red dye. And boy, I'll tell you what, mm -hmm. it was almost impossible to get out. Mm. And so what he's saying is, their hands are stained with this same crimson. Mm -hmm. The blood-stained hands, this indelible sin and perversity. And so this was as permanent as die without the Lord. Mm -hmm. Only God can remove the stain of our sin. But then when he says they shall be white as wool, if you come to me, repent, Confess your sins. Mm. They'll be white as wool. Wool yeah. is naturally white, mm. and white is is uh, portrays what is clean. So God's not only offering to forgive them; mm -hmm. He's offering to transform them. Mm. Hallelujah! Yeah. But it required obedience yes. and repentance. Mm -hmm. So when we look, uh, I think you're going to cover that. So mm -hmm. I'm going to skip that. So what I want to do <laughs> in the few minutes I have left, I want you to get out a pen and a paper. Well, I talk to so many people who don't understand God's forgiveness or they think that God, uh, it's only in the New Testament that we see forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's look. Yeah at what the gospel prophet tells us. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 43, verses 25 and 26. Isaiah 43, 25, 26. This is God speaking. Mm -hmm. He says, I, even I am he who blots out your transgressions mm -hmm. for my own sake, mm -hmm. and I will not remember your sins. Mm -hmm. He says, put me in remembrance. Let me, let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. Yeah. You know, this is a great revelation of grace in the Old Testament. I, I love this. To not remember your sins Amen. means God's not going to act on those sins. Mm -hmm. To to forget it is to hold back from acting. If you remember something, when it says God remembers, it means he's going to act on it. But when he says, I'm going to forget, mm -hmm. I'm going to hold back on acting on uh -huh. it. Mm -hmm. So now look at verse uh, Isaiah 44 and verse 22. Just write that down, Isaiah 44, 22. Again, this is God speaking. Mm -hmm. I have blotted out mm -hmm. like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Return to me mm -hmm. for I have redeemed you. Yeah. See, God provided for redemption uh -huh. mm -hmm. even before the cross, but it was based on the cross alone. Mm -hmm. The sacrificial system that he instituted, the forgiveness by the blood of the animals, it was symbolic. It mm -hmm. all pointed 
to the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the earth. And what happened when Jesus died? His death validated those Old Testament sacrifices for the forgiveness of sin. Now look at Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we, mm. like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. All have mm -hmm. sinned. Mm -hmm. All have sinned. Uh -huh. right. But he says, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Doesn't mm -hmm. that remind you of 2 Corinthians 5, 21? That's right. When it says that God made him, Jesus, mm -hmm. who knew no sin, Amen. to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So when you accept Christ, when Christ went to the cross, all of our sins were on him. Mm -hmm. But when you accept Christ, when you ask for forgiveness, his righteousness is credited to your account. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. <laughs> and he right. says to us in Revelation 1, 5, it is to him who loved us mm -hmm. and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Yeah, that's right. And you know what? Even that washing is even for the people of the old covenant. Listen, mm -hmm. Hebrews 9, 15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. Get this. For the redemption of the transgressions mm -hmm. under the first covenant. Yes. You yeah. know, that's very important that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Yeah, right. I got to get to these because these are good. <laughs> Isaiah 55, mm -hmm. verses 6 and 7. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Well, you talk about a yellow highlighter for promises, Jill. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are worthy. <laughs> Seek the Lord while he may be found. Mm -hmm. Call upon him while he is near. God is calling to you today. You at home. He's calling to me. He's calling to you. Mm -hmm. God is calling. It's an invitation to you. He is saying, seek me, call upon me. Let the wicked forsake his way mm -hmm. and the righteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. him. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon. Yeah. God is ready to forgive you. And I've just got to get this one in. I'm yeah. just out of time. <laughs> but listen to this. <laughs> David, when David confessed his sin, you know, he mm. was guilty of murder uh, with Bathsheba and her husband. He was guilty of adultery, guilty of murder. But when he went to the Lord and confessed his mm. sin, and he says, oh, wash me, mm. wash me, purge me with hyssop, wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Mm. If you want to see a great way to repent, just read Psalm 51. That's where yeah. that's from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But later David said in the Psalms, he says, as far as the east is from the west, mm. so far yeah. has he removed our transgressions from us. And here's proof of that. Hmm. In 1 Kings 14, 8, just write this down. God tells the prophet, you send the prophet's wife, go tell Jeroboam. He says, I've torn the kingdom away from the house of David. I gave it to you. And yet you have not been as my servant, David. This is God speaking, hmm. who kept my commandments and who followed me with all of his heart to do only what was right in my eyes. Hmm. What? <laughs> David was guilty of all yeah. kinds of sin, mm -hmm. but he repented. And mm. when he did, God's mercy was bestowed upon yeah, him. Right. And God is saying, as far as I'm con as it <laughs> concerns me, I forgot. I'm not acting on that's that right. sin. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. You talk about <laughs> grace in the Old Praise Testament. The Amen. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm taking my mask off. <laughs> and I'm I putting mine back on. on. <laughs> Praise the Lord, Shelly. Yeah. I think you're on fire. All right. I'm not sure if that's what it is, <laughs> but thank you for warming that lesson up. Amen. To eat or be eaten. Well, I like the way that the writer uses that phrase, to eat or be eaten, when in fact the text talks about being devoured. I want to begin Wednesday's lesson by reading verses 19 to 31, because sometimes it's important to get the context so that we won't end up in pretext. 
Verse 19, if, I want you to notice these words as we go through. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Mm -hmm. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured. That's where the other word eat mm -hmm. by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. How the faithful city has become a harlot. Mm. It was full of justice, righteousness lodged in it. But now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follow after rewards. Mm -hmm. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the, cause, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. Therefore, the Lord says, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, ah, I will rid myself of my adversaries and take vengeance on my enemies. Mm -hmm. I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross and take away all your alloy. Mm. Mm. I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with justice and her penitents with righteousness. The destruction of transgression and of sinners shall be together. And those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed, for they shall be ashamed of the mm. terebinth tree, which you have desired. And you shall be embarrassed because of the gardens mm -hmm. which you have chosen. Oh. For you shall be as a terebinth whose, leaves, whose leaf fades, and as a garden that has no water. The strong shall be as tinder, and the work of it as a spark. Both will burn together, mm -hmm. and no one oh. shall quench them. My, my. Well, God is really, as Shelley pointed out, and as we built up to this point, God is trying his best to get their attention. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the writer asks the question, what theme appears here that is seen throughout the Bible? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to unpack the theme that is found in Isaiah, because it begins in verse 19 and 20, if you are willing... If you refuse, what we have to come to discover is the promises and the blessings of God are always conditional, Amen. always uh -huh. conditional. God always leaves the choice of obedience up to us. That's... Now, when you think about it, and I think that's how parents are, they say, if you clean your room, then I will. <laughs> if you behave yourself, I will give you the car keys. Mm. We do not reward disobedience with a blessing, and neither does God. Uh -huh. Human nature is sinful as we are. We don't say to the rebellious, we're giving you more rope. We're giving you more money. Mm -hmm. We're giving criminals more access to <laughs> banks and all the things mm -hmm. that they do. We don't do that. But why, do, why don't we do that? Because God doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. But you'll find that what is talked about in Isaiah is how God has always been. We find this in Deuteronomy in the writings of Moses. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19 I call heaven and earth mm -hmm. as a witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, mm. that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, yeah. and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, uh -huh. and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, mm. to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, mm -hmm. to give them. God's blessings and promises are always conditional. So I have three things, Jill, three things, Yay. All right. three lists that are compounded in a few statements. Mm. God is an if God, not an iffy God. Okay. <laughs> God weird. is an if God, but God is not an iffy God. Like God's that. requirements are non-negotiable, but always conditional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right non-negotiable, but the conditions yeah. are up to us. Mm. Look at the, let's first look at the non-negotiable part of God. God never asks more than he requires, and he never requires more than he asks. That's right yeah. now. Think about that. That's deep. God never asks more, more than he requires, and he never requires more than he asks. Yeah. God said, here's what I'm going to give you, but here are the conditions. He'll never ask for more, but he'll never take less. Mm. We find that from the very beginning between um, Cain and Abel. Cain gave God what he, God never required. God never accepted it, and we know what happened with Abel. Let's look at the conditional side. I will do what I promise 
if you do what I require. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the non-negotiable part of God, but the conditional side of it. You know, the fact of the matter is many people forfeit the blessings and the promises of God because they live a conditional Christian life. And I was looking at that mm. uh, panel. I was looking at that when we think about today, the world we're living in. We have 30,000 plus denominations, uh, Ryan. Mm. 30,000 wow. different denominations, mm -hmm. all coming with this idea that, well, that's your interpretation uh -huh. of the text. Uh -huh. Well, that's not what the problem is. The problem is not our interpretation. The problem is the human heart. Mm -hmm. Many people refuse to comply with God's requirements, and then they want God to comply with their requests. <laughs> True. And it just doesn't work that way. Mm. And that's why the majority of Christianity is more critical than compliant to God re God's requirements. Yeah. They criticize, mm. well, that's God wants me to keep the Sabbath. Well, I don't want to keep that because, and then they say, well, take this instead. Uh. No, God is not that kind of God. But what is the problem? The problem is not God's requirements. Mm -hmm. It's the human heart. That's right. Romans yeah. 8, verse 6 to 8. Mm -hmm. For to be carnally minded mm. is death. Yeah. Look at the comparisons, just like Deuteronomy, just mm -hmm. like Isaiah. Yeah. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, yeah. for it is not subject to the law of mm. God, neither any of its requirements, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Notice uh -huh. the contrast. Well. Uh -huh. God's law is not the problem, it's the carnal heart. Mm -hmm. Here's another example of God's non-negotiable requirements coupled with the promise of his conditional blessings. Mm -hmm. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 43. This is another example in scripture. It talked about the leaders of God, but notice something was left. Mm -hmm. It speaks about Asa. And he walked in all the ways of his father, Asa. He did not turn aside from them, doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Mm -hmm. But look at this. Nevertheless, uh -huh. the high places were not taken away. Mm. For the people offered sacrifices and burnt incense on the high places. You can do what's right in God's sight up to a certain point, but still there are things in your life that needs to be torn down. Yes. Example, the Lord says, if you love me, keep my commandments. But notice, those are the, those are the requirements, mm. but here's the blessing. And yes, I will pray yes. the Father, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he will give you another uh -huh. helper that he may abide with you forever. Amen. We want the help, or we want the Spirit of God, but we don't want to keep his commandments. Oh, Christians, on, don't man. let any pastor tell you that the commandments of God are not requirements. Uh, that's, right. that's a lie. I don't want to even tiptoe through that. <laughs> You're asking for the Spirit of God without following the commandments of yeah. God. If you love me, the condition, yeah. mm. I'll send you another comforter. That's why the apostles said in Acts 5.32, Mm. And we are his witnesses of these things. Mm -hmm. And so also is the Holy the Spirit, Spirit whom yeah. God has yeah. given to those who obey okay. him. If mm. you are willing and obedient, Amen. that's where the blessing comes. Mm. That's why the Lord says, God is not seduced by Christian substitutes, but he is moved by loving obedience. For Samuel 15, 22, but Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Mm. No, to obey is better than to sacrifice <laughs> yes. and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Let's yeah. go to number two. God is a God of choice. Yes. He does not force our hands. What about the choice? We read that. And if it seems evil to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Yeah. If, it is, seems, if it seems evil, you got to make a choice still. And the third one, God is a particular God. Mm -hmm. What is the particularness about God? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. Why is there no middle ground with God? Because there's no such thing as a partial blessing. It's either a full blessing or none at all. Come on now. God is not an iffy God. That's right. But God definitely is an if God. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Maybe he should have keep his mask off a little longer and I keep mine on. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God for that. But we can move uh, smartly right on to Thursday's lesson. Um, this was a little bit challenging for me. A lot of things that covered in here. I found, you know, my own heart and life needs to be some changes. I don't know about you, but uh, Thursday's lesson, it says ominous love song. Uh -huh. So I thought, you know, go to the dictionary, ominous, let's make sure we get it because I'm looking at love song. I'm looking at something love and then it simply means it's evil. It can be threatening 
and sinister. That's kind of interesting <laughs> thought compared with, with the love thing. So right. Isaiah chapter 5, let's read the first seven verses. Isaiah chapter 5, read 1 through 7. Again, gives us foundation here. Now it says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song, and of my beloved touching uh, his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard, and is very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered it out of the stones that, and planted it with the choicest vine, built a tower in the midst of it, also made a, notice he made something, a wine press in the midst of it uh, thereof, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes. Uh oh and it brought forth wild grapes. Hmm. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judea, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. I love this verse I always have. It says, what could have been done more to my vineyard mm. that I have not done to it? Mm. Wherefore, therefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. Verse 5, and now go to, and I tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof. It shall be eaten up, break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come uh, briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Verse 7, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The men of Judah is pleasant plant. He looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. Mm. Or righteousness, but behold, a cry. Oh, I know it's a lot of information and probably pastor here and some of us could get several sermons just out of one or two verses of that. But I think it's good to look at because I'm, I'm looking at a question would have to be asked as we read this. What's the meaning of it? And I think it'd be fair to say this parable. What was the meaning of it? If we don't get that, we're not going to get what we're talking about here. And, and if you've read along with us, verse 7 really gives you that. So take time to read that again. Now, God uses parables to help people to look at themselves, number one, honestly, mm. and to do it objectively. And how many of us really are honest and objectively when it comes to ourself or even to our own kids? you know, to our own religion. It's, it's, it's very hard sometimes to look at something and be really objective like God would have us do is to look through, certainly through his eyes. But the Bible does say, as I read in there in Second Chronicles 13, 5, it says we need to what? Examine ourselves. So this is very scriptural here that we need to look and examine ourselves and be honest with ourselves whether we're really in the faith or not. And a lot of times we say that we are in the faith, but maybe, you know, we need some changes to take place. I think the book of Isaiah is just beautiful when you get into it because I, I'm seeing already brought out love, the love of God. The love of God has for us. His mercy, His grace is coming back. And no matter how far you wander away, you can hold, you know, what that song, I wandered far away from God, but Amen. now I'm coming home. So that's the beauty that we can come home to him when we confess our sins we come he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins he wants us to see i think at least in this part in thursday's lesson to see our true condition god calls this interesting a a love song i'm saying a what, love song what it's it's revealed from the beginning of isaiah in fact through the whole scripture that number one bible says that god is what first john 4 8 god is love, is love isn't he he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Interesting. Love, then to me, is an attribute of heaven. Mm -hmm. not, not love like goes on in the world today and what we call love. Man, it's messed up as far as yes, I'm concerned. True. But the only way I know what love and try to comprehend just a little bit of it is when I behold Christ or I behold Calvary. Mm -hmm. That says love to me. That's right. It helps me to understand it better. God then, he gives all of this stuff, it shows in this parable, it's beautiful how he bestows everything upon us and all he wants, interesting, all he wants in return is love. That's, right. mm -hmm. yeah. That's all he wants from us is love. There's nothing we have that he really needs, he just wants love. And he says, I, I gave you the good grapes hmm. and my, 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 if you didn't give me the, the wild grapes, and you know that's translated stinking, yeah. huh. the That's stinking right. grapes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> See, sometimes these words we just have to look at and look because it's, well, he gave me wild grapes. No, stinking grapes is the way heaven looks at it here. It's not good grapes. <laughs> Youth instructor, I like this in 113, 1898, this was written. It says, where love exists, please, if we get nothing out of these lessons, where love exists, there is power and truth. 
Uh -huh. If love exists in the church, if love exists in your heart and my heart, your heart here, then we're going to see that there's, there's power there, there's truth there in our life. And notice, love, oh, I love this. Years ago, I read it and I shouted. It says, love does good and nothing but good. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I had to take myself a little whipping. <laughs> because it says, true love, love, true love does nothing, right? Good and nothing but good. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we see things not so good maybe come out, but praise God, we can go back. And those who have love bears what? Bears fruit is what this parable is about into everlasting life. Now, why was this parable put into a song? Well, you know, you can make it, well, it, it'll make it a little bit more thrilling if, it, if it's, it's a song or it might have a, a different effect upon somebody else in, in our minds or whatever. Or could it be that God said this here because in a song we can learn it more easily. Mm. We can commit it to memory more easily. So God, again, once is looking out for us. God has many ways to try to wake us up as sinners. Think about that. Oh. He has many ways in which to try to wake us up, and I'm praying daily He'll help me to wake up and see things for what it really is, the changes that I need to make in my own life, and I guarantee you there's so many that we don't even realize. But I, I ask you to keep praying that so God will reveal these things to us. Amen. And again, to be sorry for our sin, we come, we repent, and we're sorry for our sins. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 says, for godly sorrow, you know it well, what? This is repentance. Yeah, leads to repentance, right. That's what godly sorrow is if we're really sorrow for our sins. So here in chapter 5, the great blessing he's given to his people. Notice this was, what those this? He just, again, all he wanted in return is just love. He just oh, wanted us to exactly. commit ourselves to him. Let's look at just a few things real quickly here, quickly, I think. Great things that God did for his people. Number one, there's five of them. We'll see if we get through. Number five, they were, oh, praise God, they were his particular people. This just jumped out and gets you. I mean, so you just, you have to jot them down. Isn't that right? He, notice this, we are his peculiar people, means we're his purchased. Isn't that right? Okay. We're his purchased possession. And that, notice this, and he acknowledged them as his own. Mm -hmm. He acknowledges us as his own. You talk about an awesome thing. Amen. God can look down from, from, from glory and look at you and yeah. look at me and look inside, read your heart, read your mind, read everything about you, know where you're headed, know what you've been thinking, know what you've been doing. And yet he can look down and he said, they're my people. They're my people. Because uh -huh. he looks at me and he sees a finished product if I'll let him come in and finish it. Okay. Aren't you glad? If he looked down and see the mess they are, just maybe turn around and say, well, we'll look for somebody else. Okay, number, number two, his vineyard had extraordinary soil. In this parable, after, in other words, he's making everything to where we can bear fruit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? See, I, you're my special people. I'm going to do special things for you. The soil that you're going to plant in is where it's going to be extraordinary. I'm going to do great things so it can produce a crop. Three, he fenced it in. Did you notice that he fenced it in? A fence can do what? It serves as a protector, protector. does it not? Mm -hmm. Inside and outside sometimes, True. but it's a protector. And uh, so no one could get in to hurt them because the, the eyes of the Lord are on us constantly. And uh, notice what happened. He, he built the fence. He gave us all these things, but what happened? We tore the fence down mm -hmm. by our action, by our lifestyle. We tore it down, and then the enemy came in. Mm. Note four. He gathered the stones even out of the ground. First thing you do, you go to plow, you go to disc, stones. You, you pick up all those things that's going to hamper you. And I look at those stones as the weights. Hmm. Hebrews talks about those weights that so easily beset us, the Amen. things that discourage us sometimes. These are obstacles. God said, I'm going to take those out of the way so that you, when you sow, there's going to be a harvest. I like that. Number five, he planted, notice it, he planted it with the best vine. And I said to myself, <laughs> who is the vine? Right, John Jesus. 15 says, it, right. isn't it Jesus is the vine? That's he right. said, I'm the vine. He gave us the law. He gave us the, what, the, the Holy Spirit. He's given us, you know, we look at things today, truth and light. And John 16, 13, lead us into all truth. And I like this in John 15. We're going to get close to being done, but praise God. John 15, <laughs> verse 16, I like this. He says, ye, ooh, he said, you, you have not, I like it. I like it. I don't like it. I love it. Preach. Because it says, ye have not chosen me. That's right. Mm. But what? I, but I have chosen you. I've ordained you to do what? To bear fruit. Amen. That's the bottom line. Oh, no. Okay. Amen. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Amen. What an incredible study. Oh, mercy. Praise the Lord that there is hope. Yes, <laughs> there is condemnation Amen. as in conviction. Satan brings condemnation. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. There's conviction to our heart, but there is hope in Jesus. Praise Amen. the Lord for that.
I want to give each one of you a moment to share something about your day. Pastor Ryan. Absolutely. Uh, you know, my lesson is just bringing out the fact that uh, the lesson I gleaned from it is that God is calling us all to repentance. Come on now. And so uh, we're living in a time where we need now more than ever to take self-inventory, mm -hmm. uh, to do some self-examination. And that's exactly what God was calling Israel to do here in this first chapter of Isaiah as he's pleading with them Come on. that uh, they turn, return to him amen. and forsake self. So I think that's the message we need to glean from Tuesday's amen. lesson. Amen, amen. And what then if we think of what he said in I Isaiah 118 when God said, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Yeah. Reminds me of 1 John 1, 9, when he says, if you confess your sins before him, God is faithful and just to forgive us our yeah. sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's Hallelujah. Right. That's right. I said, God is not an iffy God, but he surely is an if God. Yeah. We find in Proverbs 1, verse 23, look at the conditions of God, but look at the promises of God. He says, Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. What's the condition? Turn. And then I will do. I will pour out my spirit on you. May you not be an iffy Christian, but may you take hold of the if of God and uh -huh. be blessed. Ooh. Glory. Second Peter 2, verse 21. Pull this thing down. This says, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness then after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Verse 22 has something. God's called you out. He's cleansing us, right? He's calling us into a wonderful new relationship with Him. And we need to make sure we don't do verse 22 where the dog is turned to its own vomit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much, Pastor Kenny, Pastor John, Shelley, and Pastor Ryan. Just thank you for opening up the Word of God and for sharing from your Amen. heart. I am excited about this study and the journey that we're going to take together. Thank you for joining us. Um, this scripture jumped out at me as Pastor Kenny was talking. This is Isaiah chapter 5, but this is verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, oh, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, yeah. who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I think the call in this entire first chapter is who are we? This crisis of identity to recognize our need uh -huh. of a savior. Mm -hmm. We need Jesus to come in yeah. and to transform our lives. Mm -hmm. Make sure you join us next week. Lesson number two, we look at crisis of leadership, Isaiah chapter six. I'm Jill.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. And happy New Year. Happy, happy New, New Year. Year. It is so good to see you here today. I want to offer a very warm welcome to all our members here this first Sabbath in the New Year, and especially our guests who are here with us. Thank you so much for coming into the house of the Lord. You know, David said, let us go into the house of the Lord. And he was talking about the physical house, wasn't he? Amen. And Jesus himself did the same thing when he was on earth. He went to the synagogue every Sabbath. So thank you so much for coming out to here to worship with us today. And for those of you who are online, I want to also extend a warm welcome to you today, the first Sabbath of the new year. You know, generally speaking, before COVID, we would actually greet each other with a hug and a, and a handshake and all of that, right, Terry? We'll do all these things. But unfortunately, we can't do that anymore, at least not for now. But I'm going to ask you to do something. I want everyone to stand where you are. Just stand. And all greeting is going to be a wave. Turn around and wave to somebody and say, happy Sabbath. Just wave. Good, just wave to everybody, say happy Sabbath and happy new year. Thank you so much, that's wonderful. Upstairs too, happy Sabbath, happy new year, great. Thank you, have a seat now. So this was a year, 2020 was a year that we are going to forget. And we're gonna focus on 2021. You know, in 2020, 2020 COVID-19, everyone I'm sure was surprised by what took place. We weren't, we were caught off guard. You know, but there's one person who was never caught off guard, and that is God. Amen. He's the omnipresent and omniscient God who knew what was gonna happen. And so he wants us to have faith in him and trust him. He's the only one we could trust. So I hope as we begin the 2021, the first Sabbath here in his courts, we would continue to trust him as we go through the new year. Amen? Amen. So thank you so much for coming and welcome. I have one bit of business to take care of, and I'd like to do that at this moment. And that is a transfer of membership, and this is the second reading for three and four individuals, as a matter of fact, who are going to other churches. Enoch Tyson is going from our church to the Lancaster SDA Church, and Cynthia Derwin and Sandra Henderson, they are moving from our church to the Pennsylvania Conference. I'd like to have a motion to accept these requests. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you so much. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you so much. God bless you. And may God continue to bless us as we worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Our call to worship this morning is Holy Spirit. Please stand. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free. And my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Let us 
just become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. be seated. Everybody. Happy Sabbath. I'm here. I'm the representation of my dad. Um, so this is the first time I'm doing it. But Minute Ministry um, for me is basically witnessing. And um, you may be asking, why should we witness? Um, that's what, as Christians, that's what we are supposed to do. We are to spread the word of God. And for example, the, the scripture, John 3, 16, is such good news that we can't keep it to ourselves. We have to share it with other people. And you may be asking, when can we witness to um, those around us? All we have is now, the time that we are living in right now. We could do it during our everyday activities, wherever we go, maybe work, school, wherever we have the opportunity to, we can. We cannot change what happened or what didn't happen in the year 2020, but we can do something now in the time that we are in. And we have to do everything now for Christ that we are capable of. You may be asking, how can we witness? We can witness um, based on our story, what happened to us, our personal like encounters, our testimonies. My personal encounters may not be the same as Terry's, may not be the same as Donovan's, but something that happened to me may touch someone that is going through a hard time. They may really need to hear that. And we could share our stories with other people if you believe the word of God, go and tell, go and share, and someone will listen. You never know what someone may be going through. Whatever that word you spread with them, they would actually like and feel so enlightened and encouraged. So that's something that we should do every single day. Just share the word of God, and we would be blessed, and ourselves would be blessed, and so would other people. Have a blessed day. Amen. Amen. next song is Shout to the Lord.
call to prayer this morning is in the garden, hymn number 487. Uh, please meditate upon the words as we sing this hymn.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy so Sabbath. Glad to see many faces here. It's been a while. Um, if you all can, let's bow and, uh, and let's pray to God now. Dear Lord, we are thank you for your wonderful mercy and grace that you've given us through this year. Certainly a challenging year, Lord, for all of us. Father, we are thankful, though, that you got us through it. We are taken care of. We are in good health. And I know, Lord, there may be some of us who may have other challenges in our lives, but we're here and we're alive and we're worshiping your name. The best place to be on earth. Father, I ask that those that are still having other problems, challenges, that I know that there have been many, many, many things that have happened to people in this year. I know, Lord, that you'll still have control over the situation. And anyone, anyone who's willing to come to you and ask, Lord, you are ready there to help. Father, I'm asking that you continue to bless your church, continue to make sure that your word continues to expand and to be able to reach those that are still needing the truth and the hope that you are one to give them and the salvation that only Jesus can provide. Father, I ask that the service may continue according to your will. And as we receive your word, as we receive all of the instructions you have for us today, may we reflect and internalize it in our hearts so that we may obey. Thank you for your wonderful grace. I know we deserve none of it, but you are that good and continue to be so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I stay in the garden with him. Though the night around me be falling, but he be the joy we share as we take 
Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is Luke 21, 28. So when my troubles begin, don't be afraid. Look up, rise your head high, because the truth that is your liberation is fast approaching. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. How's that? Okay. New Year's. Um, this is what I remember New Year's being like. You can turn me down a little bit. And on the next slide, as I'm talking, if you can just turn the background to it down a little bit. My grandparents and I, we used to sit and watch Dick Clark. Yes? Okay, thank you. We used to watch Dick Clark. I'm sure Ryan Seacrest does a lovely job, but for me it was Dick Clark. And it wasn't always Dick Clark's New Year's Rock and Eve when I was a kid. It was a little more subdued, but that was the face and the setting for New Year's. And I don't know what it was about being a kid, you know, that was like, I want to stay up and watch the what? The ball drop. You know, someday we all are going to have to, like, look at the history of the ball dropping thing because I have no idea where that came from. <laughs> but it's a part of my growing up, my thinking about the new year. Well, apparently, Seattle was the place to be this year. So let's see if that's going to work. Oh, don't tell me it's not going to work. Oh, no. Oh, no. All right, did anybody see what happened at the Needle this year for New Year's? Did you see it? It's fab. All right, hold on, let me just try once. This is the new year in 2020, apparently. And so I guess we just figured that we needed something a little more, you know, encouraging for uh, all that we've been through through this year. So it goes on for like 12 minutes. And if you get a chance to watch it, they put it together very, very quickly. Um, once they realized that they were not going to do public fireworks in Seattle. And somebody um, put this together from a very vivid dream that he had and uh, some kind of a graphic designer, and that was the place to be, apparently, for New Year's. Unfortunately, 2020 wasn't such a great ride, was it? Not such a great ride. And so we had fire, and we had it here and there and everywhere, and we had water, lots of it, some people got lots of it, and some people, there was a little bit, but there was nothing left to everything that they uh, had woken up to that morning. 2020 um, has been different in the way that we <laughs> do things. How close we can be to one another. Our, uh, we had a nice uh, gal come in today, and she asked me, she said, do I have to sit anywhere specific? You know, when you walk into a church, that's not usually something you have to worry about. But in these days, that's something that we have to worry about. And then there's these, which are now hanging from your rearview mirror, right? Okay, lots of us have them hanging from our rearview mirror. And then there's trying to balance, you know, business and health. And we've never had to do that on such a grand scale before. And so that's been a challenge for 2020. And then there's all the political ramifications. The people who made money when they knew something long before you knew it. And I don't really, to tell you the truth, I'm not really upset that they sold their stocks. What I'm upset about is that the next morning, 
that they weren't in their car, in their place of constituency with all of their hospital directors and the people of influence in their town, that they weren't sliding pieces of paper across the desk so that they could have plausible deniability that they never said anything. But um, that was my concern. But some people felt like this was all that they could do with what was coming. And it's been a tough year. I'm certainly not the first person to offer that uh, sympathy to you for 2020. Some of the American um, sayonaras for 2020 have actually been quite vitriolic. <laughs> so we're not going to do that here today. What we are going to do is just examine a couple of principles that might be helpful for us for 2021. Are you up for that? And I'm just going to learn right along with you. One thing that has come to the surface that I have found very educational would be the calm word as a Christian is this idea of there is a lot of discussion now, a lot of rising to the surface, a lot of difficulty and, and uh, conflict over what I'm going to call labels. You know, the little sticker that you put on yourself that says sometimes your name and sometimes a label is about your philosophy or your ideology or what you hold dear or what you hate most. That can be challenging when it comes to labels. And here's one of the most difficult that I'm having trouble with as the year unfolds. There's a label. This country has given me a lot of things. And there's some journeys that some folks have made in this country that I can't understand because I haven't made them myself. But I think it's important right at the, as we come out of the gate today to remember this right here. To the Lord, how many nations, friends? All, All nations are merely what? A drop in the bucket or dust on the balance scales. You know those little scales that you used to use in grammar school? Dust on the balance scales. All of the islands are but a handful of what? That he can sift through his fingers. So that's where we're going to start today. When we talk about the lessons that we might learn out of 2020 and moving into 2021, let's just start there. That to the Lord, all nations are merely a drop in the bucket or dust on the balance scales. All of the islands are but a handful of sand. And so, friends, if that's true, what does that make us? Just a grain of that handful of sand. I just want you to know that her crying is, like, brilliant to me. Because I haven't seen her grow up. And so, I, like, when she walked in past me this morning, I was like, wow. And so, you guys don't worry about it at all. We are like a grain of sand in the palm of God's hand. But friends, that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. So labels. They're in the news all the time now. And so let's just put one up there. Because I want you to know that God has experience with these things. How about that one? Okay, so what is the last definition, the last expression on this particular slide of a Gentile? A non-Jew. There's a label. There's the Gentile, and there's the... Are, is there anyone who could be more divided spiritually, socially, fundamentally than a Jew and a Gentile in the time when Jesus was walking the earth? Right? Right? So I want you to know that God has experience with these things. And I want you to know that God knows how to manage these things. Because, friends, we are citizens of where? Heaven. Where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. Lives. And we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. Yes? So if 2020 gets me, like, a little closer? If 2020 is a pretest, because that's in my heart of hearts what I think it is. If 2020 is the pretest, because God loves me so much that he's not going to drop the whole ball of wax on me at once. 
And I got to say, if it's where he is, that's where I want to be. So friends, if we are going to be like him, if we are going to, um, you know, like dream about being like him, if he's our model, if he's our hero, then we're going to have to do a little investigation as to how we're going to move through all of these difficult situ situations to navigate. And all I'm going to give you is a couple of tools for your tool belt. There are many. And the Spirit himself is going to empower you most boldly, I'm sure. But let's start here. Let's start with your heart. And let's start wha with what's in your heart. Because, you know, stuff flows out. And it tells a tale <laughs> when it flows out. So we're going to look at a couple of instances in Jesus' life when we're watching what's flowing out of his heart. And, and we're going to let it inform us as to how we might conduct ourselves in 2021 if things are going to be at least the way they were or maybe worse. All right, what is this a model of? The temple. So you're looking from the top down. So you can see the shape, okay? It's a series of concentric, smaller spaces, correct? At the very outside is the what? Court of the Gentiles. There's a label. <laughs> All right, the Court of the Gentiles. And you see, what was supposed to happen is that folks on the outside were supposed to have access. What's the word? Access to what? No wrong answer to the question, so everything you're saying is right. Access to God, access to worship, access to change, access to healing, access to forgiveness, right, right? Except that's not what was happening in the court of the Gentiles. You see, because Jesus showed up and his heart was pouring out some very specific things. And the word we're going to use in this segment of our talk today is passion passion because don't you think the news has been filled with passion and don't you think that political commentary has been filled with passion here in America and don't you think that public health has been filled with passion here in America so we're going to look at a, a moment here in Jesus life where he was filled with passion he made a whip of cords and he drove them where out out of where out of the court of the Gentiles. Why did he do that, friends? In the temple enclosure, the scripture says, he found people who were selling. Is the gospel for sale? No. Selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers sitting at their tables. So he made a whip of cords. Now, you, I just have this wonderful picture of Jesus in my head. He's like untying the animals, right? I need that. Go, go. Have a nice day. Okay? And then he braids it very adeptly in his hands and ties a little knot on the end. Because he is serious. And there is passion flowing out of his heart. He made a whip of cords, the scriptures say, and he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. Can you hear it? Can you see it? And he walks right up to this guy, this very, very well-dressed gentleman, sitting behind this table filled with coins, and he looks at them with his heart full of passion, and he's like, no. No. And he overturns the table. And he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And then he said to those who sold the doves, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of commerce. His disciples remembered that it is written in the scriptures. And we're going to look and see what is written in the scriptures. He opened up that outer space for those that had the big ugly label. Yes? For those that many, even of his close posse, would have deeply disagreed with in the way they lived their lives, in the choices they made. And yet Jesus felt this heart of passion. His heart was on fire. That's one snapshot of passion when your heart is on fire. 
but look at where his focus was to open the door. Was his focus to shut the door? No. To open the door even for those with labels. So let's look at another nuance. We have passion, and then we have compassion. We have a heart on fire, and now we have a heart that's what? In touch. And I'm suggesting that if we could grab on to these, there's going to be three, if we could grab on to these three things, then we'll be navigating the current American climate with a little more wisdom, a little more maturity, we don't have to be the kid on the horse in the jockey outfit. We could actually be getting down there on the track and making some laps and getting some stuff done. All right, so here's Jesus again. He went through the whole of Galilee preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. And somebody who really had a label came to him, begging him on his knees and saying to him, if you are willing, you are able to make me clean. Clean. What was the man's label? He was a leper. And being moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be made clean. And at once the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Now, something weird happened after this story, and this is woven into the tools that we're talking about. After he healed this man, what was the next thing that Jesus did, the very next thing? It's okay if you don't remember. And I know you can't, like, whisper to your neighbor and help them out. He said to him, in, in the scriptures, it says he charged him sternly. He grabbed him by the shoulders. And without any social distancing, looked him straight in the eye, sharply and even threateningly, the original word has a great urgency in it, and acting with deep feeling, he pushed him in a certain direction while he wailed in his ear, and what was it that he told him? Don't tell anyone. Now, friends, like, are you serious? What was the label? And was he a leper anymore? And I can't tell anyone. He wants him to go to the priests and go through the process of having his ritualistic cleansing. Because, see, Jesus is moving in this place where his heart is in touch, where he has a heart of compassion. But he sternly warned him, immediately sent him away because this is what Jesus was trying to communicate to you and me, friends, in this day and hour, I believe, is that he did not have a spirit of bring it on. Are you with me? And if you're not familiar with this story in the scriptures, it'll be plain in a couple of seconds. Friends, the scriptures say, for while we were still helpless at the what? The appointed moment Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus moved through his life as a student of prophecy. As a fulfillment of prophecy. In the book of Daniel, it tells us the great long timeline. And we knew that Jesus was coming right around A.D. 27. And we knew that his death, based on Daniel's prophecy, was going to be how many years later? Three and a, three, three, three and a half years later. So friends, I ask you again. Jesus, as a student of prophecy, when he's telling this leper, please, go down to the priest get your cleansing, get your certification, get your permission slip to go home, and don't tell anybody. What was he buying for himself? Time. Because if you read the story, did the man listen to his admonition? And what happened because he didn't listen? Jesus couldn't move in the region. His ministry was his hampered under that umbrella of bring it on. A 
heart on fire, passionate. A heart in touch, compassionate. Now here's a word that you may not have thought you should add to your tool belt in this day and age. It's a heart that's a lot less heated, a lot less fluid. And I'm going to suggest that you can watch Jesus using this tool in his encounters with Pilate. Now, I know that looks a little like Richard Burton, but, you know. Pilate. You remember? They bring him to Pilate's judgment hall. And the background, friends, is that Pilate's wife, what did she say? Have nothing to do with this. No, there's a word you're missing. Just. Have nothing to do with this just man. So Pilate already knew that this was bad. Like, don't touch this with a 10-foot pole. Because his wife had had a dream. But he, to placate the spiritual and religious leaders of the day, to try to balance the political climate, the spiritual climate, he questioned Jesus again. Aren't you going to answer? Listen to all their accusations against you. A lot of cacophony, a lot of confusion, a lot of disinformation, a lot of misinformation. And using this last tool, friends, what did Jesus do? He said nothing. Passion. Compassion. And sometimes, friends, please, please, dispassion. Because dispassion is not fluenced by strong emotion, able to make rational and impartial decisions. Don't you need that in this climate? Yes, you do. Dispassion is a heart at rest. Because when all the clamor and the crazy is going on, you know to whom you belong. The nations are as dust. And you are held as a grain in the hand of your father. And so I'm going to ask you, friends, if you just you know, want to chew on it, think about it, that these texts will help inform who you should be in this world right now rejoice with those who rejoice weep with those who weep live in what harmony with one another do not be haughty associate with the lowly never be wise in your own sight repay no one evil for evil but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all if possible now, friends, we know there's going to come a time when the line of demarcation is going to become razor sharp. And then things will change and decisions will need to be made. But until then, if possible, as it depends on you, not anybody else, just you, live how? Freely. By this shall all men and women and children know that you belong to me. Why? Because there's love wherever you go. You don't have to agree. Jesus didn't agree with everybody that he sat down to eat with. Right? He sat down with all kinds of labeled people. But his Willingness to sit and eat with them in that culture meant that he considered them neighbor, brother, fellow traveler. Didn't mean that he agreed with everything they did or did not do. And so even in the middle of these crazy times, we can find it. A policeman and a protester they are just like, man, I'm wet. This is hard work. And so if these two wonderful men can do it, we can do it. We're called to do it. Death, a lot of death this year. Public and private, known and unknown. 
and someone who will be known for going down in history was laid in state outside the Supreme Court and she went to see her. How we conduct ourselves, how we label ourselves matters. It matters. So friends, power, politics, and money. Revelation talks all about it. Here's a symbol from the book of Revelation. We know that ultimate failure of power politics is coming. And that if you really want to be a resistor, then first and foremost, you should just demonstrate your loyalty to your king. Period. Because that's who you belong to. Because he himself is not depicted, even in the book of Revelation, as a Samson-like slayer of people. He's the slain lamb of God who sits upon the throne. And it should inform how we conduct ourselves. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. And so here's the place for us to hang our social responsibility and our spiritual responsibility. Moving in our communities for as long as we can because we don't celebrate a bring it on spirit. Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Second half, excuse me, first table of stone. And the second, second table of stone is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's your responsibility. That's my responsibility. Even more now as we see the day approaching. Terry and I had the privilege last November, and we've been reliving our jaunt. We have to. We're going crazy because we can't go anywhere. We've been reliving our trip, although we haven't gotten here yet. I haven't. She has. I'm going so slow. I'm still in Montmartre in France. <laughs> I'm like, no, I just want to stay in this little town for another week or two. This is Omaha Beach. The average age... Oh, I'm sorry, I don't think I can do this without a little emotion, but it's me, so you'll forgive me, right? The average age of those who are memorialized in this cemetery, what is it, friends? 24. 24. Abraham Lincoln would have said they gave the last full measure of devotion. In a no-win scenario. <laughs> So I'm just asking you, friends, can we not be a demonstration? Like our king, the slain lamb who sits on the throne, can we not say calmly and quietly, intelligently, maturely, that we are able to make a sacrifice if it helps? To weigh it out according to how the Spirit is calling us and drawing us. In the five days leading up to December 7, which was what day? Pearl Harbor Day. The average number of daily deaths in America related to COVID-19 was 2,566. As the lives lost daily to the pandemic eclipsed the number of Americans killed at Pearl Harbor, it was hard to imagine the grim count could rise to 3,764 dead on December 30. And January is going to be worse. Friends, Jesus wants us to stay engaged. Sometimes it's tempting to either bark at it or just separate yourself from it because it's so overwhelming. But I recommend this text. And this small, <laughs> small and temporary trouble we suffer will bring us what, friends? Tremendous and eternal glory much greater than the trouble if we follow in his footsteps, if we are led by his spirit, if we become the word made what? Flesh. So, eyes on the sky. Yes? Yes. 
looking out to the horizon, you know, to see like what's out there, what's happening. And so I don't, uh, my encouragement today, my admonishment is not to say, don't be a good student, don't pay attention. As a matter of fact, I want you to pay attention. But I want your heart to move in a certain way, in a certain spirit, as you gather up information. All right, let's see if this is going to work. Did it work? There we go. December 21. Anybody say up for it? It was cloudy. Okay, but Denise is, I'm a little persistent. So I actually, all of the wonderful astronomy geeks who had their telescopes up on YouTube, I pulled up a couple of those. And then uh, NASA had something up. And I watched the whole thing. And then on the west coast <laughs> from Griffin, is that the observatory that's out there? I watched it again. And so it was such a powerful thing because, you know, like Saturn's like sneaking up behind Jupiter and you're watching it, you're watching it, and then all of a sudden because it was coming down so low in the atmosphere, it was getting dusty and blurry. And so they went away from their feed, from their telescope, and bang, you just saw it hanging in the sky over Los Angeles. Gave me goosebumps. So friends, I don't want you to not be someone who takes mark of the horizon. I do. But we have a tendency to be the kind of people that just want to name it, call it, say how it's going to happen right now. But if we are finally going to catch a star in our hands, if we are finally going to be the kind of people that God wants us to be with our eyes on the sky, we have got to change that, I think, just a little. So here's my admonition as we close. What is this? It's an eclipse. And I watched the last big one we had on my phone, of course, while I was working on a patient. And when the, when the moon came over, the corona, did you ever see it happen? It like, it disappears. The whole sun disappears for like a second and then bang, the corona just bursts out from behind. You'd think they were playing the hallelujah chorus. I'm working on my patient and tears are streaming down my face. But I want you to know, now just listen to this, okay? I don't expect you to catch it or remember it. Just listen. The moon orbits the earth in a plane that is inclined to the plane of the ecliptic at an angle of approximately five, deg five degrees. When the moon has the same ecliptic longitude as the sun, it's called the new moon. When the moon has an ecliptic longitude greater than the sun by 180 degrees, we call it a full moon. It takes approximately 29 and a half days for the moon to go through all its phases and become a new moon again. Twice every lunar orbit, the moon crosses the ecliptic. These two points are known as the ascending node and descending nodes. Then the shadows happen, then eclipses happen, and bang, bang. Now I want you to know that since Newton's time, they do just this little bit of fudging. But except for that teeny bit of fudging that they do, it's completely predictable, yes? You can count it down. You can watch it happen over and over again. You can call it, call it, call it. Very cool. But friends, you can't do that with this. Now, there are certain things that we could call all the way down in history based on Daniel's prophecy. And then Revelation comes along and John opens the scrolls and opens the book. So yes, there are certain things that we can call. But when time comes to its end, I believe Jesus left the last part of it open-ended on purpose in mercy. Because if you ever told you, if anybody ever told you what was going to happen in 2020, let's say like in 20, 2002, 20 years before, would you have believed it? Even if somebody wrote you a clue, like for a puzzle, you know, could you have known everything politically that was going to happen, everything socially, everything economically, everything in the public health arena? You could not have known that, friends. And that would have been a good thing. Because you would have lived your life in fear. Every day, every decision you made would have been affected by what was coming. The only thing that we have to worry about that's coming is Jesus himself. I'm not saying don't be smart. 
I'm not saying don't pay attention. I'm just saying, please, please lay down in your heart full of fiery passion, in your heart of compassion, in your heart of dispassion. Move smartly through the world and lay down the need to know and the need to predict. I think it'll serve us all very well if we're informed, if we judge with discernment, and if our grace comes to us daily. I think that'd be a great idea. So let's be like Jesus. Let's be tender. Let's give people access, no matter their label. Let's be present for them, even if we don't agree with them. Let's practice dispassionate communication in a time when nobody can hear one another anymore. And let's pray. Because January is going to be rough. It's going to be rough. But I would remind you where we started, that God holds us in the palm of his hand. None of this has taken him by surprise. And he is bigger than the coronavirus. Even the new strain, which is 70% more contagious than the one we've got. It's in three of our states, so it's right in our backyard. So please, friends, safety, safety, safety. Be smart. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. All right, I'm going to change how I was going to end this, and we're just going to move straight to a song together. Terry, I'm going to steal your stool. I'm just going to go over here because I'm old and I can't hear unless I stand in front of this speaker. All right, now, I think I just messed with the audio, folks, because I took my computer over here. <laughs> Nick, you have this song on the E drive. Can you play it from there? All right, let's pray while they're working on that. Father in heaven, we are grateful to you. We are so grateful to you. And as we sing this song that everybody knows, beautiful name, as we sing it, as we hum it, as we worship, I pray that's what will happen, that your spirit will come and rain down upon us and let us worship together. Lord, we, we're just little kids on the back of a pony. I've been in this denomination for more than 30 years. And every day there's something new to learn about my church, myself, the scriptures, my world. And so we just pray that you will make us effective ministers for you in this world, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember, friends, Jesus said the Spirit of the Lord and we can claim it for ourselves, is upon me. How about if we claim it for ourselves? For he has anointed me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, that the time of the Lord's favor has come. All right, did, I, did it work? Yeah. All right, so go ahead. Just mute mine.
All right, we're gonna just plug it in and we're gonna try it from down there. And if I can't hear it, then we'll just. We'll just worship anyway, how's that? go. Turn it up a little loud for me, would you? Okay, here we go. I'm a little nervous. You were the word at the beginning, one with God.
that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise. It will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people everywhere whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. Father, we want to thank you for your warnings and your empowerings and your equippings. And so we just ask now, Lord, that you would send us out these doors ready for what 2021 has to offer. Without deep worry, acknowledging our emotions, confessing to you our angers, and holding ourselves willing to be used, hearts on fire, hearts in touch, hearts at rest. In Jesus' name, amen. song is I will follow. Happy Sabbath. Happy New Year. Have a blessed week. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. I'll 
sir. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Yeah. Happy Sabbath. Have a blessed week.